coming up on Market to Market. As one state makes progress on the fight against avian flu, the nation's top egg producing state endures additional outbreaks. Rail shipments of U.S. crude oil soar and scrutiny increases on tracks carrying the world's most heavily traded commodity. And in the Northeast, producers tap into tradition, hoping for sweet returns on their investment. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, May 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The outbreak of highly pathogenic avian flu is putting pressure on the country's top egg-producing state, where more than 25 percent of the hen population is affected by the virus. Late Friday, Iowa Governor Terry Branstad declared a state of emergency over the avian flu outbreak in the Hawkeye State. This proactive approach is aimed at protecting the industry. Earlier this week, in the north-central Iowa County of Wright, a state of emergency was declared even without a confirmed case. Wright is Iowa's top poultry producer with 15 million birds. Last week, a facility in northwest Iowa began destroying more than 3 million hens following the discovery of the H5N2 virus. Avian flu now impacts one of every four egg-laying birds in Iowa and has pushed losses north of 20 million turkeys and chickens nationwide. While deadly to birds, there is no evidence H5N2 affects humans. Government officials in the upper Midwest have been dealing with another issue moving across the region for decades. Railroad shipments of crude oil have increased 5,000 percent in the last six years to almost half a million trips annually. And rules proposed Friday by U.S. and Canadian officials would require rail cars carrying the flammable freight be built to higher standards in an attempt to reduce the risk of catastrophic events. If adopted, the mandate would retire thousands of older tank cars prone to rupture. However, a 15-month-long investigation of a North Dakota derailment revealed a different problem. Faulty axles on rail cars carrying grain are getting the majority of the blame for a December 2013 derailment in Castleton, North Dakota. The National Transportation Safety Board issued their detailed report on the incident in which a grain train derailed first and then was struck by an oncoming locomotive carrying volatile crude oil from the Bakken Shale region. The NTSB report showed more stringent tests involving old tank car axles might have prevented the collision. A letter from federal transportation officials cited ultrasonic tests on second-hand axles may have detected internal faults on the BNSF train. The company did conduct a required examination of the axle back in 2010, but the more rigorous test would have revealed the faulty equipment and the axle could have been taken out of service. The Castleton derailment was less than six months after the deadly explosion in Loch Magantic, also involving a train carrying Bakken crude. Subsequent incidents involving the highly volatile cargo pushed officials to look at more arduous inspections, tougher rail cars, and the makeup of crude oil itself. Also this week in North Dakota, lawmakers approved the formation of a state-run rail safety program intended to supplement federal oversight of the oil train traffic. The three people to be hired for the pilot program will assist the fewer than a dozen Federal Railroad Administration employees already handling inspections in the Peace Garden state. Currently, the two existing inspectors split time between Montana and North and South Dakota. BNSF Railway has already expanded their footprint in the state to 30 workers who spend all or some of their time inspecting railroad bridges and tracks. As the production in the Bakken region has increased, so has the rail traffic. 
Between 2000 and 2012, train trips across the state have increased 233 percent. North Dakota's Public Safety Commission says 75 accidents related to track and equipment problems happened in that same time period, causing more than $30 million in damage. The economy received mixed reviews this week as major indices moved higher after a rough four days. U.S. government figures revealed gross domestic product. The broadest measure of economic activity slowed dramatically in the first quarter of 2015, growing at an annual rate of two-tenths of one percent. The Federal Reserve downgraded its view of the U.S. economy in light of slowing growth, softening business investment, and declining exports. The board gave no indication interest rates will be rising anytime soon. According to the conference board, consumer confidence fell four-tenths of one percent in April to the lowest level in four months, driven by a slowdown in hiring. And Americans also are experiencing higher gas prices, as AAA reported the average price per gallon bounced up to $2.55 in April. As analysts hope consumers will start to move outside and shake off winter's economic chill, one commodity takes its cue from a change of seasons. In the Northeast, a sweet and storied process gets its start with warmer weather. This annual rite of spring gives a boost to the nation's perception of the region and a shot in the arm to the local economy. Josh Bittner explains. Our country's earliest sugar makers were firmly rooted in their craft well before Europeans arrived. But it was the union of native tradition and colonial technology which laid the groundwork for North America's enduring maple syrup production model. Nowhere else in the whole world does the sugar maple tree grow naturally, and we don't plant it. Out of every five hardwood trees in New England, two of them is the sugar maple tree. While much of the country turns the page on Old Man Winter, states like Maine, New York, and Vermont typically undergo an early spring freeze-thaw cycle, spawning a woodland sucrose infusion. With temperatures seesawing from overnight freeze to 40 or 50 degrees during the day, the tree's root system gains access to fresh water. Plant starches are nourished, kick-starting a saccharine windfall that lasts an average of six weeks with favorable weather. Once the sole means to an end, metal buckets still hang out in the rural northeast this time of year. A reminder that the seeds of this sugar-coated culture were sown in nostalgic soil. Many producers opt to bring the forest to them by installing intricate networks of vacuum tubing. You're not moving. Roughly 10 taps feed a main line, which uses gravity-induced suction to expedite sap downhill for refinement. Tim Taft, a fourth-generation sugar maker, runs 650 lines on 100 acres of sugar bush, or forest, near Huntington, Vermont. And while tubing is a cost-effective way for the family operation to move raw liquid, maintaining an infrastructure that can be compromised by weather and wildlife requires constant vigilance. So I'm just going to redrive this spout and fix the problem. Mother Nature has her way of keeping us under control. Uh, this year we had a really bad snowstorm, lost power for five days, broke a lot of tree branches. Uh, it took us somewhere around 600 man hours to clean up the branches that were all on our lines, holding our lines down in the snow. Besides upkeep, several intensive procedures overlap in the journey from tree to barrel. Raw maple sap is approximately 98% water. But through a kind of sugar house alchemy, the balance of sucrose to water is flipped on its head. This is a reverse osmosis machine to concentrate our sap from raw sap closer to syrup where it would be ready to go in our evaporator. Boiling off excess water pushes the elixir's sugar content to nearly 70% but 40 gallons of sap reduces to just one gallon of syrup. Syrup last year that we sold was uh, $2.60 a pound, and that's a, pretty, that's a pretty fair price. Every spring, timber sugars off to transactions in over 20 states. And while the sweet stuff flows as far south as some portions of the heartland, 
the undisputed king of U.S. maple syrup production is Vermont. According to USDA, the Green Mountain State accounted for 40% of the over 3 million gallons of the nation's maple syrup in 2014. It's a tens of millions of dollar enterprise. It employs an ever-increasing number of people. It's attracting all kinds of entrepreneurs. It's our fastest growing ag sector in the state of Vermont. It is probably the most valuable thing you can do with your land if you've got a good sugar bush to work with. Farms like Taft Milk and Maple offer a textbook example of classic Vermont agriculture. Year-round dairies with seasonal sugaring operations. But some producers have abandoned the volatility of dairy to scale up on maple alone, despite weather uncertainties and short harvest windows. Brandon Family Maple Orchards are seventh generation sugar makers who see larger opportunities for this variety of sweetener. I think the future looks really bright. I think more people are understanding the benefits of maple. It's got a low glycemic index, so it breaks down in your body real slowly, and uh, which is a lot better than uh, uh, other sugars that hype you up. So this is as natural as it gets. According to the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers Association, an industry promotion group, antioxidant levels in maple syrup exceed those of raw cabbage, tomato, and cantaloupe, while the sticky substance's vitamin and mineral levels outweigh most comparable sugars. Maple fights an uphill battle for market share with sugar cane and sugar beets, but the syrup's arch nemesis could be the offshoot of one of America's largest cash crops. You always got to read the label because sometimes it's false advertising. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jemima's not the most welcome person in Vermont, that's for sure. On average, grocers stock more flavor-enhanced imposters than genuine maple syrup. And the disparity is attributed to price. Overabundant corn is simply cheaper and easier to produce. That's really where our competition is. It's not New York State, it's not Maine, it's not Quebec. It's, uh, it's those corn syrups that, that people think of as maple syrup. Maple advocates make their argument on quality, not price, touting the health benefits of pure product over highly processed food additives. But the American maple industry is somewhat accustomed to riding shotgun. While Vermont is the domestic leader, Canada, led by Quebec, rules the world in maple production, churning out 12 million gallons per year. The U.S. has worked with its northern neighbors in recent years to replace a convoluted American maple syrup grading system with a universal standard for both countries. According to the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers, the province's market share has actually dropped over the past decade, from 80 to 72%, while the U.S.'s portion has increased from 16 to 23 percent. Strategic Reserve really helps us in Vermont because it really sets the floor um, for the price of syrup, and it has helped to stabilize the prices quite a bit. Canada imposes legal quotas on producers and stockpiles surpluses in its strategic maple reserve in order to control supply and demand. Exchange rates offer competitors on both sides of the border advantages for moving product, but buyers value quality. The big wholesalers will purchase syrup for a little bit more, usually if it is Vermont or U.S. versus Canadian. Um, but then the, the U.S. dollar versus Canadian dollar is also another big big deal. And this year, um, with the U.S. dollar being stronger, it makes it more advantageous for them to go to Canada and buy syrup. While several New England producers try their hand at retailing maple products themselves to control income and pricing, some of the commodity is repackaged in bulk for worldwide markets. Sealed in barrels, syrup will keep indefinitely, giving a little wiggle room to the laws of supply and demand. If the market demand goes up and, and syrup gets short, they'll, they'll start to pay a little bit more for it. But if the sweet smell of success doesn't boil over this year, America's maple sugar makers will try their luck tapping into revenue next season. So now I'm gonna drive it back in again. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Ideal planting conditions pressured markets this week as producers were operating full throttle in the fields. For the week, July wheat lost 15 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 7 cents lower. Soybeans rallied in the middle of the week, but gave it back, declining 6 cents. Nearby meal prices fell $1.40 per ton. 
In the softs, cotton improved again with the July contract, gaining 27 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, the May Class 3 milk contract moved 35 cents lower. In the livestock sector, prices were mixed with the June cattle contract surrendering all of last week's gains to settle $2 lower. Nearby feeders declined 60 cents, and the June lean hog contract improved $1.80. In the currency markets, the euro moved three basis points higher against the U.S. dollar. Crude oil had a big week with a $2 gain per barrel. COMEX Gold lost 50 cents per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained more than eight points to settle at 443.75. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Now, you're a Kansas boy. Mm -hmm. You're wheat country. We're watching this wheat market continue to fall apart week mm -hmm. after week. Darren, talk to us about what happened this week and what can we expect in this week coming ahead. Well, wheat continues, as you said, wheat continues to go down. The condition of the wheat crop also continues to go down. Uh, you know, there's, there's getting to be growing concern that, you know, 30, 50 percent of average uh, you know, is what all we might see when, when the combines start rolling here in another month, month and a half. You know, the problem is market doesn't care at this point. So we see the July Chicago contract going down. We see the Kansas City uh, July contract continuing to make new lows. Traders aren't going to buy into the death of wheat until it's proven as the trucks go across the scales. It's just, you know, it's just what's happened over time. They've tried buying into this thing too often. It's so hard to kill wheat. Always seems to come back. Now, next week, we will see the Kansas Wheat Quality Tour go across. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they find. I don't think it's going to move the market one bit, uh, but it will be interesting to see day to day uh, what type of damage from drought to freeze to, to uh, disease. All of these things are probably going to run across as they make their way across the state. That being said, how much downside potential is left in this wheat market? Well, as low as it can go is zero. It's going to be hard to push it below that. Um, in all honesty, uh, it, you know, it, it's kind of a, a wild card. I mean, it shouldn't be going down right now because we are cutting into the crop. We are, it's decreasing in size every day, every week. But again, nobody cares. Nobody's going to buy in. They're too busy watching other aspects, aspects of the market, global supply and demand, direction of the dollar, activity in the other grains, other commodities. So right now you just can't, you can't generate and maintain any buying interest long term in the wheat. It therefore, just keeps going down. Should producers be making some sales now on the board or in an option pit to you know, capture some of that downfall? It's so tough to make sales in wheat because, again, you're talking about where you thought you might have a decent crop. Now you're going to have maybe 25, 30 percent of it. You know, so you can't forward contract, so you can't lock in. You know, you can't lock that in. You can go out and do futures, but all of a sudden, you know, you're hedging down. And wheat likes to do these these spike moves where it drops down and shoots right back up, or whatever the case may be. So you could be hedging down here. What could be multi-year lows if indeed we do have some sort of crop problem. Very hard to pull the trigger in here. I don't want to say just sit you know, and, and wait and see what happens, but you know, you're almost going to have to wait to see what you have out in the field before you can make any real marketing decisions right at this point. Okay, now that whole discussion led us really nicely into our Twitter question. It was sent mm -hmm. in to us from Evan in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, and we invite all of you to send in your questions that come up while you're in the cab this week. Send them in to at Market to Market on Twitter or find us at Market to Market mm -hmm. on Facebook. So Evan's question, looking at the corn market, mm -hmm. looking at the wheat market, potentially soybeans, mm -hmm. how low can these markets go below the cost of production until market force is correct? Well, that's an interesting way of phrasing the question because market forces don't correct. Um, you know, there's an old saying that the market's always right. Uh, how low can they go? You know, the way I would phrase it, how low can markets go before investments, the investment side of the market gets interested again? We haven't seen that. You know, we've driven these, we've driven the grains down a great deal of, you know, going back the last two, three years. So until we find some reason for the investment side of the market to get interested, we may not be near the low yet. I still think that we are. I still think that we've probably put the low in in the corn. So it means it's kind of a toss up. We, you know, who knows when that low is going to happen. But until the investment side gets interested, it's hard to say the lows in. Well, let's talk corn. 370 old crop, 380 roughly new crop. Uh, you think we're touching lows here in the, both those markets? You know, on the on the long term monthly chart uh, for corn, 
uh, supports at 356. And so the July contract's holding above it, the December contract's holding above it, but barely. If we start to break that, then all of a sudden we're going to start targeting last October's lows down in the 330s, 340 range. Uh, you know, so we have to find some sort of buying interest coming into these markets if we want to see these technical price supports hold. Weekly charts, contracts, both July and, and uh, December, continue to go to new lows. As you pointed out in the, in the opening, uh, we've got planting progress speeding up, and U.S. farmers take no time at all to get a lot of planting done. So uh, I think in next Monday's report, we're going to see a huge jump in planting progress, and that's going to put more pressure on the December contract, more pressure on the DSMART spread. So, you know, while I think the market, corn market in, uh, in particular, should start to stabilize, should continue to hold in this area, there are enough factors out there, fundamental factors that are bearish that could really push the market to new lows, despite what some of its long-term signals uh, are indicating. So producers just hold off. You know, I, I've had a, I had a conversation or two with, with customers this week about that. Um, you know, it, it, we've waited. I hate, to, I hate to make a lot of sales in this area. But it could go lower. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, there's no doubt that it could go lower if the mark, if, if the crop turns out to be great, you know, if the weather's fine and all this. So you may want to look at doing some sort of price protection in here, knowing full well that, you know, there's a, still a possibility later in the year, say the second and third half, second, uh, excuse me, the third and fourth quarters of, uh, of 2015, markets could be well above where we are at this point. But, you know, the danger is, what if we really break this thing down and see another wave of selling hit this market? Then we really have a problem on our hands in corn. Okay, well, now, speaking of, of another wave of selling, let's talk soybeans. Yeah. Thursday, Friday, yeah. big move to the downside. Talk to, talk to us what's happening in soybeans. You know, soybeans, uh, as of Wednesday, and, and even Thursday morning, uh, had gone to it and contracts had gone to a new high for the week, looked, you know, again, on their, on their weekly charts, on, on other charts, that they were getting ready for a bullish breakout. And then, as you pointed out, Huge sell-off, uh, you know, reversal on on Thursday, continuing that on uh, on Friday. Erased all of the gains that we'd seen earlier in the week. We still have solid demand. We still have what looks to be solid fundamentals uh, in the market, uh, at least domestically. But again, it can just it just can't find any buyers, and so down it goes. And then the weight of what's going on in South America, the huge crops there, uh, offsetting some of the some of the support from good demand for our our supplies. So again, no reason to rally seemingly lots of reasons to continue to grind lower. So be risk averse, it would seem. Yeah, you know, uh, Friday was a very tough day, uh, particularly in soybeans. Uh, you know, first day of the month, you know, there was some idea that maybe Thursday selling was just some, uh, you know, some bookkeeping, uh, cleaning up some positions to, to close out April. And then we'd see what happened on, on May 1st. Didn't happen. We didn't see the buyers come back. Now we have to wait and see if they'll get interested again on, uh, you know, as, as we get deeper into May. All right. Well, let's jump into the livestock markets. We saw uh, another sell-off again, mm -hmm. another seesaw sell-off here in the mm -hmm. cattle market. Uh, we seem to have found some stability. Any reason for a move one way or the other? You know, probably not. I mean, you're going to see this choppiness, I think, continue in the live cattle market. Feeders really seem to take off and run a little bit on Friday. Uh, but the live cattle market's really getting a little bit choppy in here. It's an interesting combination that the long-term trend on its monthly chart shows that we put a top in last, uh, you know, last winter and that we've been coming down since then. Fundamentally, though, the market's still bullish enough short-term to keep it from collapsing. You know, we've seen some cattle, cattle on feed reports that weren't, as, you know, the, the, we didn't see the growth, uh, we didn't see the expansion that we thought we were going to. Uh, and then the, la the later, uh, the, the, the most recent cattle on feed did show some expansion. So it comes and goes. Longer term, probably starting to look a little bit more bearish for the for the cattle market. Now you touched on feeders having a little run up on Friday. Do you think that'll continue into this next week? If feeders could, uh, they're a thin they're a thinly traded market, and so sometimes when you get them on a roll, and if co if corn's down, which you know corn could probably come in lower again next week, that could give some more support to the feeder cattle market. Same situation as with uh, the live, the long-term trends down, but we're still seeing this this secondary bounce in the market. So I think that could continue into next week, uh, and if nothing else, maybe provide some selling opportunities for later in the summer, possibly into the fall. All right. Now, the interesting uh, <laughs> market in the livestock sector has been the pork market. Yeah. How much of this week's dollar eighty run was due, in your opinion, to this outbreak, continuing outbreak of avian flu? Yeah, you know, that's a great question because uh, I've heard that I've heard that mentioned a lot, uh, and and it 
while I'll look at the chart and I'll say, here's where hogs turned, it coincides with the continued expansion of this avian flu situation. So, you know, is that the fundamental backing for what we're seeing on the charts? It very well could be. Uh, we've seen some commercial buying coming into the hog market. In other words, the spreads have acted like uh, cash markets trying to firm. Now, we've had a bit of a retracement. You know, we've got about a 33% retracement going on in the hogs right now. It's going to take something extra. It's going to take continued support from the cash side of the market to push it up to that 50% retracement. But right now, you know, hogs are trying to push higher. They're leaving some air underneath them, which is always a little bit dangerous. They're going up a little far, a little fast. Uh, so if it ever turns, there's nothing to come back to. So, and hogs like to do that. They like to turn quickly. Right now, looks like they may want to try to push higher a little bit. Now, a watching the cash side of this market, how quickly could we anticipate a correction on the cash side? Are we just looking at, at market-ready hogs? Mm -hmm. Is that what's driving it higher? You know, it, it could be. Um, I wouldn't look for a huge adjustment in the cash market. You know, we might be a week or two away from that happening, and that's if the futures market can sustain the rally that it's on. Then we'll start to see the, the cash market adjust. If this is just a quick pop in the, in the futures market and we run up, we get that 33% retracement, run out of gas and pull back down, cash market won't have to adjust that much. All right. Well, Darren, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your insight. Oh, well, thanks, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Darren and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions submitted via our Twitter and Facebook pages in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we will finally meet a photographer who is capturing the changing role of women in agriculture. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. <laughs>